Artificial intelligence is here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Daniel Lopez. This is the AI Education Conversation, where we explore the opportunities, risks, and the impacts of AI across education. Let's jump in. What's up, everyone? Hope you're in good spirits as we enter the fall season and have officially hit the daunting month of October in education. Hang in there, use your days, and I hope that this episode brings you as much joy this week as I had making it. As you all know by now, I'm passionate about college access, and when I'm not talking about AI, I'm exploring ways to support students with achieving their college dreams. In today's episode, Marie Bigum, founder of Accept, and I will explore the impacts of AI in college admissions. Let's jump into a few AI updates. ChatGPT can now see, think, and hear. ChatGPT is getting a multimodal upgrade in the next couple of weeks. Specifically what this means, OpenAI will be adding a talk feature where you can ask questions verbally and it will respond verbally, much like Alexa or Siri. Additionally, ChatGPT can now see. I have to be honest, I'm very excited about this added function and I've been waiting on it a little bit a while here. Really what this means is you're now able to add pictures in your prompts as you provide directives to ChatGPT. This can range from uses such as maybe you got a DIY project that you're troubleshooting, you're trying to get your girl started or you're trying to paint something and you can take a picture, ChatGPT is going to give you some advice on how to navigate that issue, looking at the picture and analyzing the picture. could also range to something like ChatGPT analyzing a complex data set or a complex graph and being able to interpret what that graphic shows. High level, I think the multimodal aspect has the potential to be a huge feature for schools. But just like the written prompts, there's going to be that big learning curve. I actually plan on developing some specific use cases to show how these multimodal features will work when they are live on the actual chat GPT. And I'm going to share that down the line to show why I believe that these could be an added game changer. For my next update, I actually wanted to circle back to an insightful note that Amanda Bickerstaff from AI for Education brought up in our last episode around the physical costs of using generative AI. The Associated Press actually recently published an article exploring the water usage in rivers of central Iowa needed to power those big supercomputers managing ChatGPT. A lot of leading tech developers, including Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, they've all actually acknowledged that the growing demand for their AI tools carries hefty costs, from the expensive semiconductors to the fact that it does actually lead to an increase in water consumption. Powering AI like ChatGPT actually does take a lot of electricity and it generates a lot of heat. And apparently to keep this, to keep it cool on those hot days, keep these supercomputers cool, these data centers need to pump in water, often to a cooling tower outside its warehouse sized buildings. UC Riverside researcher Xiaolei Ren estimates that ChatGPT gulps up around 500 millimeters of water, which is pretty much about a 16 ounce water bottle every single time anybody asks between 5 to 50 prompts or questions to ChatGPT. Environmentally, I have to be honest, I don't really know the impact of this water usage, and I don't know if this increase is having like a drastic immediate impact, but I do think knowing that AI is going to continue to grow, it is very critical that we're keeping our eyes on the physical resource costs of generative AI and AI, the emergence and increase of AI as a whole, because it does appear to have a pretty significant physical cost here in terms of water consumption, electricity, and some of these other things that are coming and powering this underneath the surface here. Let's also talk celebrities and deepfakes. I've shared in numerous episodes my concerns about AI deepfakes because they're good. They have a lot of social and political implications that I think could really impact a lot of aspects of society. Recently, We've had some more instances of sophisticated AI deepfakes, which are essentially audio, picture, videos using the name, image, likeness of notable figures. In this particular case, YouTube sensation Mr. Beast and actor Tom Hanks. Both uh, actors and figures warned their fans on social media that AI deepfakes had been circulated through videos without their consent, with Hanks appearing in a dental plan commercial and Mr. B saying he will be giving out $2 iPhones. This year, we've also seen deepfakes make their way into numerous political ads, both in the United States and other countries. I don't have an answer, 
on how we mitigate the impacts of deep fakes. But I have to say, given how sophisticated and high quality they have become, it is very clear to me that I think one of the biggest initial threats we are going to have around artificial intelligence and what it brings to our society is the potential spread of misinformation using believable mediums. Let's jump to my conversation with Murray Bigham. I gotta be honest, today's episode is a special one for me, and it's because I had the opportunity to interview Marie Bigham, someone who I've, re- I've respected and I looked up to because of her many contributions to the field of college access over her career, most notably through founding the group Accept. In high schools across the world, seniors are undergoing an intensive season as they determine their next step after high school. College admissions officers are scurrying across the country to talk with schools and students about their institutions and awaiting the sea of applications headed their way as they make decisions on their freshman class in the next six months. Now, amid all of this, in this annual season, we've been thrown a huge monkey wrench in the form of artificial intelligence, which for many students really caught on after last year's submission cycle had ended. This year's application leaves some really big unanswered questions. How are colleges going to use AI? To what extent should students be using AI on their applications? How can AI transform the application and matriculation process as a whole? Marie and I dig into all of these questions. Reflecting back on this conversation, to be honest, all I can say is buckle your seatbelt and get ready for an absolute master class from Marie, who really talks and, and shares the, the, the depth and the breadth of her knowledge on the college admissions landscape. While I also normally don't do this, Given this is a college access episode, I also wanted to put in a couple of quick plug on some great opportunities to dive deeper into the world of college access if after listening to this episode, you are hooked like Marie and I. So let me briefly start here. First, when I'm not having amazing conversations with folks about AI, I'm serving as the managing director of program for a phenomenal national college access organization called One Goal. What I'm personally most proud of in working with One Goal and what keeps me deep in this work is our commitment to service partners bringing solutions to our schools. Not a one-trick product. If you work in a school community and you're interested in deep post-secondary planning experiences for your students, which, which can radically change how they think, prepare, and approach the college application process, or you're in a season where your school and district is looking for meaningful training or coaching support, check out OneGoalGraduation.org. Feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. One Goal partners with school communities across the United States, so don't hesitate to reach out. Secondly, for any of my friends living in the Northeast, or if you happen to find your way out here, I'd also love to invite you to One Goal Massachusetts Annual Partnership Summit. It's happening on November 16th at Babson College. Our Partnership Summit is an annual day of learning and conversation between folks interested in tackling some of the biggest challenges to ensure equitable access to and success in the post-sec secondary education for students. At this year's summit, I'm actually also going to be leading a workshop on AI and education live. I'm including the RSVP in our podcast description. If you want to RSVP, feel free to message me too on LinkedIn and let me know you're coming. Finally, I'm also really excited to announce a new passion project I'm going to be working on in my free time, College Bound Gaming. College Bound Gaming is a YouTube channel where I will be posting short, engaging college advice tips directed to students in an effort to democratize the insights I've learned over my career in a format which students can identify with. If you know any students applying to college or gearing up to do so, feel free to share the channel. I will also occasionally be jumping on Twitch and streaming my gaming live while answering questions folks in the audience may have about their application. My hope is that by bridging college advice and gaming, I can create a space for the new generation to do research and apply to college in a way that makes sense for them. That's all the updates I have. Really excited to share this conversation with Marie. As always, let me know what you think about today's conversation. Curiosity opens doors, connections build bridges, learning paves the way, humans at the heart of AI education. Marie Bigum, welcome to the AI education conversation. Thanks so much, Daniel. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Wow. Um, this is this is a big get for me. I'm really excited to have you on as somebody who has dedicated uh, you know, most of my career to college access. I think for those folks who are listening to this and um, don't have too much context around, you know, who you are and what you do, I'd love to to just kind of start there. So, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're kind of what I would consider to be uh, a rock star in the college admissions world in particular around uh, just like how you really push, like, I think, you know, conversation around race, right? In admissions, yeah. you know, for many years here, even before it was kind of the cool DEI thing to do in the, you know, the last few years here. 
you know, just to give you a chance to tell your story a little bit, like I'm very curious to know as, as someone who hasn't had a chance to talk with you too much one-on-one yet, like how did you end up in college access and like, where are yeah. you now? What are you up to now? Sure. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm equally honored to be here. Thank you so much. And I always get a little, I don't know, last year weirded out when someone's like, oh, you know, like people know you in this field, but I live in New Orleans and that's relevant in this way. I once saw a fortune teller as one does here with, you know, frequency and this person read my palm and she said, oh, you are a very important person to a very small number of people. And mm. I could not <laughs> stop laughing. I was like, that's a great encapsulation of my day. Um, so my name's Marie Begum. I live in New Orleans. Um, I've been a part of the college admissions community since 1997. I worked first for my alma mater, Washington U in St. Louis in admissions, uh, where I was really focused on, on the recruitment and retention of students of color. At the time, though, we called it uh, multicultural recruitment because, you know, it was literally last century. Uh, 2004, I left and I became a college counselor based in a high school. I mean, I lived kind of all over the place. So from New Orleans to, I'm sorry, I went from St. Louis to New York, where I worked at Riverdale Country School, and then San Diego, California, where I worked at the Bishop School, then Dallas, Texas, where I worked at Green Hill School, and then New Orleans, where I worked at Isidore Newman School. So all very fancy private schools where... There was a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation about college and what what families were expecting of their students and of the school. I was lucky enough to serve um, in, in a lot of really interesting national leadership ways, but primarily through NACAC, um, National Association of College Admissions Counseling, and that's one of the umbrella organizations for this work. And I served on the board of directors for NACAC from 2013 to 16. I think this is an important part of my story. I'm a multiracial Asian woman, I'm very Gen X, I was born and raised in the Midwest. I very much was raised with that mindset that, that, that you get as a person of color, that you have to work really hard, you have to work twice as hard to get that seat at the table, that you work and you climb and you push your way and you get that seat at the table and that's where you get to make change. I learned that's not necessarily true all the time, that the change that I want to see is not necessarily aligned all the time with the change others want to see, or if others want to see change at all. Some folks are real happy with status quo and that feel like change should be very much around the margins. So 2014, 15, 16 were messy, ugly years in this country, particularly around conversations about race and inclusion. I said, I grew up in St. Louis watching Mike Brown's murder in Ferguson happen and see it unfold on Twitter was changed my life, especially because I, I worked with 18 year olds at the time. Right. I could see the boys, the young men, especially that I worked with. I could envision them on the on the lines marching. And that was heartbreaking to me. So started this group called Accept Admissions Community Cultivating Equity and Peace today as a Facebook group in 2016. We are a nonprofit now with over 8000 supporters, folks who work in the admissions profession. And our mission is to remove the racialized barriers, the barriers to to marginalized communities that are in that path to college. Second part. Well, sorry, but the second part of my story that is the really, really unexpected thing. One of the great uh, projects that came out of Accept was a was a way to think about college admissions differently. It's called Hack the Gates, radically reimagined admissions. That was a, a project we did in 2019 and 2020. We published eight policy papers from that, of very different ways that we could think about doing admissions. And one of the papers inspired a, a tech company, believe it or not. So. Two and a half years ago, I was a co-founder of a of an ed tech firm called Accelerated Equity Insights, and we look at communication patterns between admissions offices and prospective students. We identify, measure, and then remove biases that we see playing out. Did not expect that to be on my bingo card in my lifetime, but yeah, so that's what, and I, not so much in that's what I do. So I left working in high schools, though, in 2019 to work on Accept full-time. And then, so I guess now I have two full-time jobs doing that. Well, well, thank you. And again, I'm, I'm honored to have you here. I think, you know, it's very clear that you have been in college access and admissions across all the different facets and aspects that you can really touch, you know, as it relates to, to this work. And I think maybe just to start there, that knowing that there's a lot of folks on this call who... You know, haven't been the, been in the game as long as like you and I have, and really uh, just seeing and, and experiencing a lot of around admissions. I'm curious, what types of challenges or disparities like are you seeing young people experience today, and in, in just this like college application process, high school seniors in particular, like thinking about their journey in 2023, 
post pandemic, post George Floyd, what types of challenges, right? Are yeah. you seeing that they're having to experience as they decide where they want to go to college next year when they're applying? Yeah. I think that the challenges that the students right now are facing, frankly, aren't all that different than the challenges they've been facing for a while, but with some new, some more facets and nuance to it. And that big picture overall is that the path to higher education, regardless of selectivity, and the path to paying for higher education, those processes are opaque. They don't make sense. They don't have the same rules for everybody. They don't necessarily tell the the truth or what you think that they're telling you throughout it, but it's the the roadblocks, the gatekeeping, the challenges that we have set up to make higher education so out of reach. I think those are very big picture of the issues that students are dealing with. I think the nuances that we see in 23, 24 right now, talk about the, the, the challenges of paying for college. There's this whole FAFSA, which is the federal... Form for oh I can't even remember what it stands for anymore. Free application for Thank federal you. student aid. I got you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. But at least I said it right. But the FAFSA is undergoing this major, major overhaul that's getting released late. That no one understands exactly what it's going to be. That a lot of states haven't changed their deadlines, even though that the FAFSA form is coming out what four months late this year. Yeah. Like I think that is a huge issue that we don't see a whole lot of conversation about. Unfortunately, like in the broader public. Certainly the changes to what the Supreme Court decision will mean for for students as they apply. But to me, bigger picture, how those policies unfold and spread their tentacles beyond what the court said specifically. I think those two major things right now are setting up barriers in that path that are even larger than before. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that students are getting a different experience. Yeah. You know, the terms of challenges being different, but I think they're very much amplified right now. And I think you, just for added context, like you mm -hmm. and I, I think both have pretty deep experiences. I, you know, currently work as managing director of program with One Goal Organization, really acclimated working with, you know, first generation low income students of color. Prior to that, I worked with Emerge in Houston, mm -hmm. similarly high generation, or I, excuse me, like uh, first generation low income students of color. So what, what, we're used to working with students, you know, from marginalized communities mm -hmm. and how many more challenges are exacerbated. And what people oftentimes just don't know is like you have a student who, let's say they actually want to take that big, big risk and not just apply to any college, but like some of the most selective universities that are, uh, you know, country offers. And maybe they they have the grades to really, you know, be able to like do well in that process. There's just so many challenges along the way. Every single day is a daily battle uh, as a counselor, as an educator to support that student from exposing them, convincing them that they're good enough, getting the right type of documentation so that they can actually submit all the financial aid paperwork as you described, right? Just on the FAFSA. Then there's this whole other thing that's even more complicated and invasive called the CSS profile. Yep. If you have, uh, if you are, un if you are not privileged enough to be from uh, a, a two parent household where your biological mother is still with your biological mm -hmm. father, there's a whole other set of documentation you then have to apply to. And again, this is not even considering uh, all the other things, the funding associated with some of those things, knowing that if you're a student, oftentimes, unfortunately, as much as it kills me to say this, because I wish it were true, mm -hmm. all universities aren't created equal, right? And so oftentimes people who aren't in this field, you know, say college as if college is all the same thing, but there's not, there's a very big difference between selective institutions mm -hmm. and then oftentimes, a, you know, local institutions and surrounding communities in terms of graduation support, financial aid that they'll offer. And oftentimes when we're hearing now about, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, the atrocities, if you will, about the, you know, the loan, uh, epidemic we're in and mm -hmm. how it hasn't led to a return on an investment for people who've taken it. Oftentimes those are the non-selective universities that have really, you know, okay. paid, attacked people, you know, for that. And so mm -hmm. it's just, it's so hard. Um, I think it's just, you know, to yeah. put it simply, it is so hard. There's so many different challenges, uh, taking on and in particular first gen low income students, and they're doing yeah. it for the first time oftentimes with, with help, but then, then they have all those mental hurdles as right. well. It's, it's a lot. There's <laughs> it's a so lot. much to it. And it's, you know, something that I thought a lot about in my previous life a million years ago as a student and learning about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The things that a person has to have to thrive, the start as basic as food and shelter, right? I think in this country, in the United States, in our current economic system, Having a bachelor's degree might be like the most privileged part of that hierarchy of needs, but it's there, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like to be able not even to thrive in the United States, but to be able to maintain a bare minimum level of just treading water, of not sliding back socioeconomically, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Okay, what else on the hierarchy of needs is so difficult to attain that doesn't have a price tag on it until the very end and where the price of it is so unnervingly high that that you look at it and like it's a dream killer like i i feel like the necessity that our culture that capitalism is set up for that bachelor's degree the support to get there by no means like it's not even come close to catching up to it and again, to your point, if there was at least uh, enough of a, a belief in the system at this particular point in 2023, where if I knew I worked really hard, I sacrificed, I invested, I got that bachelor's degree, then I was going to be able to, you know, acquire a job where my salary and my benefits mm-hmm. allow me to, you know, pursue that that American dream, own a home, do some of these things. Then yeah, maybe that you know, there's there's more of a belief and investment of it. But the reality is, for so many students and for so many recent graduates in 2023, that you graduate, you aren't actually making a, a livable wage, right. especially if you had to take out a bunch of loans to, right. to go to an institution. Yeah. So I worry about students of this age cohort of this generation for so many mm-hmm. reasons. And I, I think about their world as like this video game that we keep as they level up. My God, we just keep throwing more, more boulders, more things to jump over, more hoops to jump through for, for no discernible reason, but we just keep making it harder. I think you and I are, are pretty aligned here that, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably the toughest it's ever been, right. Mm-hmm. To be a, an, an aspiring high school student, you yeah. know, applying to institutions today, really wanting to, to elevate yourself, right. And, and, you know, be great and, and do some of these things and using college as a vehicle to do that. Uh, you know, but that being said, I'm an optimist. I feel like the only way you, you can be in education is you got to be at least a little bit optimistic. That's how you, you wake That's up true. every day, you dust off your, your elbows and your knees and you, you keep getting to work here. Right. Yeah. And so, that, you know, for me, the, I think a recent source of optimism has really been this AI thing that I've learned about. I was mm-hmm. just telling you, I know before we hopped on here about my first experience using chat GPT, I've drawn on many episodes around that. So, you know, our, my audience <laughs> definitely knows about, about uh, that, but I'd like to say I'm mm-hmm. cautiously optimistic. I'm not naive in, to suggest that there's not challenges and that there's things, but I also do believe that, you know, even, even to the, to the point we were making earlier, it's like transformation in education has to happen and it hasn't happened. The The system is so stubborn and refuses to change. And that goes for college admissions as well. I mean, my God, it took a pandemic for a lot of universities to finally start adopting test optional policies when even there was a lot of schools that like had been doing it successfully pre pandemic. That's what it took. Yeah. I'm just hopeful that with AI, we can, we can change that. But I'm curious again, from your perspective, like, you know, what's your reaction to AI been and what, what are you yeah. noticing around like this transformation piece? Like, what do you think it's going to take? Oh gosh, this is such an interesting question from from a couple of different perspectives for me. Like certainly the lived experience of being in college admissions, imagining how that might change that job. Uh, the lived experience of being a college counselor, how that might change how I would interact with students or how it might change their perspective in this. Um, and then something that we touch upon a little bit through the perspective of someone in the ed tech space right now. Accelerated equity, you know, we're a very, very young company, just about ready to go to market. And we very, I'll share the story because it is a little crazy. We were lucky enough to participate in this program called Techstars. So I know that you have some some folks who will be listening to this who are really in depth in tech and they understand Techstars, right? And then you're going to have educators who are like, okay. So I was in the space of, I was in the educator part, like, I don't know what this is. And a dear friend and mentor of mine said, there's this cool program, you should apply for it. I think that your company could benefit from it. And I took the perspective of being a college counselor. So I told my team, I'm going to download this application and we're going to fill it out. We are nowhere close to being far enough along or mature enough as a company to get this thing, but let's just try the process just in case. So, so we'll be prepared in two years when we're actually ready. So kids, when you're applying to college, take that risk because lo and behold, we were admitted into this program and we were one of 10 companies. And I was like, well, isn't that rad? And then I started to research Techstars. I'm like, oh my God, this is one of the hardest programs to get into of its kind, like anywhere. Like if to put it into college admissions parlance, it's like Stanford or MIT, if you want to do comp science, like it was like two and a half percent of net rate. That was crazy. I was also, because this is tech, the oldest person by 21 years in the program. So 
I was like Auntie Marie, and that was really fun. But <laughs> I learned a whole lot about AI and the applications of AI and the way that the tech world and the business world are really viewing it in a different way than I see education viewing it. So it was a very long run up to this. My initial, as I saw the reaction in the world of admissions, especially to chat GPT, et cetera, as I acknowledged my own reaction to it, I was really disappointed. I'm disappointed because, my gosh, like here we are, we immediately go to, wow, this is a really cool tool. tool. How will applicants use it against us for an unfair advantage? Like, do we really feel that way about our students that we assume the worst of them at all times? Do we assume the worst of technology at all times? Why? I was disappointed that we went that route. I was disappointed that there wasn't more creativity and future thinking, forward thinking, which leads to my current state of mind about it. I'm very, very excited about the possibilities, specifically in the work of the path to college. I'm really excited about it. But that excitement is tempered with the awareness that this profession moves very, very slow, that education moves very, very slow. And perhaps some of the ways I think this could be innovative um, might take a long time to convince people that they should do. But I'm excited now. Yeah, I would respond for initially first by saying like, it's I think it's okay to initially be skeptical by technology. And I would say naturally, being that we've been education for such a long time, and I have tremendous compassion for folks that, that continues mm -hmm. to be their emotional response, because man, we've been burned by like ed tech so many times in That's the education fair. space by the like the silver bullet that promises to be the thing. And then it's like, it takes 25 minutes in a class period of 60 minutes to just like get kids to log on and like make that part of it happen. Yeah. So like, yeah. I feel that. Um, yeah. So, but I, but I would also offer to your point, it's like the, the hope is that we can like move past that and like acknowledge that like as, as a, as a sector, right? Like let's, mm -hmm. let's not think of AI as like an individual product. It's, it's really a sector, right? There's going to be a lot of yep. use cases and a lot of different things coming. I think the technology feels like it has a potential to be transformational. And, and and to your point, I would also affirm you by saying that I've had, you know, recent converse I just had a recent conversation with Amanda Bickerstaff, who as the founder of the AI for Education, she's like doing the hard work of going yeah. to schools and districts and implementing and what she's noticing on the ground is a very similar reaction, which is a lot of folks in education still either have not heard of Chat GPT or are not trying Chat GPT. Um, there's like there still is this like reticent. There's there's like fifty other things that just matter right now in a public yes. school or even a high school before we yes. even get to talking about AI, even though in the mainstream media, it continues right. to be like very AI centric. And then the other pieces I would, I would say that your reaction continues to unfortunately be, or at least your initial mm -hmm. reaction is also what I think many folks continue to do. Because if you notice a lot of the AI education conversation continues to be about plagiarism and great yes. integrity. And it's like, yes. it's, it's the, it's the exact same like question in a different yes. way that you had. And it's like, it's like, yeah, we can choose to think about that and think that right. like we need to just make a fancier rubric, but we could also ask ourselves, okay, like if, is there a world where we could actually use this technology to just change the way we do assignments in general, right? Yes. Versus like trying to find a way to stop students yeah. from using it on an essay or to brainstorm for an essay or to do something like that, right? Exactly. And, um, but but it, that's the scarier route, right? Right, <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One, one is punitive. One is... Mm -hmm almost easier to, you know, to, to say, no, you can't is much easier than to say, let's figure out how. I will share this though, because again, very much a Gen Xer. During the Techstars program was right when ChatGPT started to like truly explode. And so I'm in this tech startup space with a lot of like Silicon Valley. Or put, so as you might imagine, every single conversation in that program suddenly became, and how are you incorporating AI? Like it became a joke amongst us, like, well, yeah. we got to figure out how to make <laughs> AI into these period products. Like seriously, it was like that. Right. And I, my, our tech mentor who I adore asked that question on a team meeting. So how will accelerated equity use AI, et cetera. And I blurted out, I don't want to be the company that causes the Terminator to happen. And he was like, what? <laughs> I was like, again, this Gen X reaction. I, I, I've seen the movies. I know what happens next. I know how bad this is going to go. And so sometimes when I, I, in conversation or some meet someone who's like so super skeptical, I'm like, listen, I understand I, that, that we all think we're going to start the Terminator. I know that. But I don't think that's how it's going to go. Also, when I said that, our tech mentor was like, 
Marie, who knows what's going to happen, but please don't be so arrogant as to think that either you're first in this conversation or that you will be the company that does that. There will be millions of companies that in an aggregate get us there. And I was like, well, that's a terrifying way of looking at it, but okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I think, and I think to your point, I, I and I kind of heard this like underneath uh, your answer there. And I, I feel like generally, as I think about implementation, I don't know that I have like the you know, the, the playbook just yet. But mm-hmm. one thing I feel I'm starting to to notice a trend in, in some of the folks that I've talked to as well as uh, just the ways that I've used it is it's probably better if you think about like problems that your organization is having or like your vision, your most aspirational vision of like what you want to accomplish. And then ask yourself, like, how could AI assist versus like thinking, like, how do you like, how do how do I just AI power my organization? Right. Because I yes. just find that like, yeah, if you're looking for the cool new like AI tools that can you know, increase your efficiency by 1%. Great. But it's like, I, I think over time, that's going to feel like, as you're describing kind of like overkill or excessive. But instead, if you're like, no, let's like totally flip the table on education and say like, instead of doing it this way, we believe that this is the way that it should do it. Now, how can this like transformational technology help us do it that way? I feel like that's going to feel like a way that in particular educators can feel more maybe bought into using it because yeah. we may not understand the technology really well. But if you ask educators, like if you could totally just burn the system down and like try, you know, start over, like what are some things you would include? Like every educator is going to have a strong opinion on, on some of those things. Yeah. Well, and I love that. I love, I love the burn down the system conversation. I love that, <laughs> that future thinking of like, we could, we could be small minded about this, right? We could be small minded and say, kids are going to use this to write their essays. And so we'd better stop that. Or we could take just a half a step back and say, we all agree, everyone in this profession agrees, all the users and customers agree, this system sucks. And Mm -hmm. while it might be accomplishing the goals it was originally designed to do, gatekeeping, especially people of color, we should be acknowledging that's not what we want this system to be doing, and that we need a system that will do actually what what we hope to do, right? Mm -hmm. To To show that higher ed is available, that it's a public good. So now we have this tool that could help us get there faster. Why don't we embrace that? And I think some people are getting there and having more of those conversations, but that's a big culture shift. It's a big culture shift. No, it definitely is. So let's maybe uh, zoom in a little bit more specifically mm-hmm. to college admissions here, because I'd love to get your your take on this. I, um, I recently res- read this article in Inside Higher Ed, and it mm-hmm. talked about how Really, there as 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 you just described, and what I'm noticing too, there's not really like a playbook right now of of strategies that colleges and universities are using around like tools or ways to implement AI versus not. I think everybody right now is just trying to figure out what are you know some of the things that we would like to use this technology for. One such example that I saw in this article was that there are some universities starting to explore like using AI to be able to sift through like tr- uh, student transcripts when students are applying to college. To the best that I could understand it to determine like any type of cutoff points or to just like simplify some of that information so that, you know, they can ultimately get to decisions quicker. I got to admit, like my initial reaction to that was that didn't sit well with me at all. Um, But I guess like, uh, you know, before, and again, I don't have like the the admissions officer experiences that you do. So Mm -hmm. that's why I'm very curious to your take on that. But I think that really my question is, is in this world where we now have AI tools and admissions that potentially could do things like that. And I think many folks also believe that like holistic admissions, it ultimately is still like a great thing for like students. Mm -hmm. Like how do you strike a balance between these things of knowing that a a school may get 10,000 applications they got to review in three months. And, but on the other side, like we want to like review and really understand every individual applicant, like where's the balance and how do we use AI? Like what's coming up for you there? Yeah. I think we should be looking at this kind of in two ways. What are the practical applications to make the job of admissions broadly more efficient right now. And I, and I say that because it, in large part, there is a huge challenge of people in admissions being wildly overworked, but also frankly, there are so many leaving the profession right now that, that offices are not fully staffed. So I think admissions offices and leaders for like the next year, maybe, maybe 18 months, could look at, at AI tools and say, how can this thing help our admissions office create create efficiencies, do parts of the job better. I don't mind the transcript thing because truly, like when you read a transcript, there are certain pieces of information you're trying to get out. What's the curriculum? What's the curriculum in context of the school? What are the raw grades? What are the trending grades? Those things, right? 
AI could do that so easily, so easily. And that doesn't take away from understanding the touch of the student. It's just something that takes a lot of time in the reading process. Um, what we're doing with accelerated equity, how can we possibly use AI to respond to emails faster, with more warmth, um, with better information, and to do it in a way where a student would feel like it's seamless, like it's not a chatbot. Doing a survey of admissions people, if they could keep up with their email boxes, it would be almost two and a, or a day and a half of work time only doing that. Okay, that creates more efficiencies. I think we pull out and go bigger. Oof, I think there are some really cool things that AI could do for admissions that flip it, that flip the table, right? That's that kind of addresses this idea that holistic admissions also is the driver of everything. But I think that's one of the myths that really needs to be busted about admissions just in general, that, that it is an interaction and a transaction between an individual student and an individual college admissions office. It's really not, frankly. The majority of the work of selection of admissions happens well before students ever apply. And that's when colleges say, we have these institutional priorities, and then they turn it over to consultants and say, to achieve these institutional priorities, could you give us strategies of how, what we need to do admissions-wise, including who we need to admit from different piles? A lot of that's driven by need to have a full class. Cyrus to claim rankings, uh, need to have as many full pay students as possible, things like that. So when I think about something that AI could do that's towards equity, I would love to see AI build out different statistical models for universities that say we want to improve our, our number, not just of Pell eligible students, but low income students broadly. We want to, you know, I think AI can do a great job at building out those statistical models in ways that humans haven't been able to do a great job with so far. I think they could do a great, I think AI could do a really great job at figuring out the financial aid process to make that easier and less invasive. I think instead of worrying so much about how an essay may or may not be used, if we really pulled back and said, how do we look at the larger policy level decisions and how AI could help do that more equitably? Yeah, I think with what you're saying, you really got my mind thinking about this this question in a different way, because I think one one use case that I've noticed, at least in ChatGPT, I haven't tried mm -hmm. out like other large language models to this extent, but I have used ChatGPT for kind of some strategic scenario uh, building type uh, use cases as as you're kind of describing mm -hmm. with with the modeling there. And what I found is like, it actually, if you are, if you're asking the right questions, like I actually think it could be a pretty good partner and just like kind of like pressure testing solutions and building like mm -hmm. your strategic plan. Right. And, yeah. and to your point, like, I think I'm also, what immediately came up to me as you were talking about that is the fact that like, even in the way that like certain universities are organized, sometimes it can be like really challenging if you're a first generation low income student to like know who to go to for certain things. Like I know sometimes I was working with students, they were like admitted to a school but then their financial aid, they were like uncertain as to like how I got it or they hadn't received it yet. But then they're like, oh, you got to call this person in this office, even though I'd been there. And so there, there just feels like there's right. a lot of like operational efficiency type totally. things that it could probably help with just right. improving as you as you kind of explore and you you uh, interact with it. Yeah. And like think about that, like chat GPT, AI, machine learning, are so good at absorbing huge amounts of data and giving different perspectives, different ways of looking, but again, just that ability to assess and synthesize huge amounts of data. Okay. So if a college says they have two competing priorities, A, we need as many people as possible who can pay full tuition, and we want to grow as many students of, as possible who are low income. Okay. I have, at least I have a feeling that that is something that these new tools could help us solve with the huge amount of data that they can crunch. Because most times colleges, when they're looking at data to make these decisions, to set these strategies, they're looking at their data set, right? Which can be large, but is very self-fulfilling as well. Like it's not as broad, it's not as diverse. So I don't know. I think there are lots of interesting ways that it could be used. Yeah, where's the innovation coming from? Who has access to innovation like that too is another question. That's where haves and have nots come back as well. To your point, that's definitely going to be an important question. I know something we were talking about earlier, even around uh, 
you know, the, the application, the fact that a lot of that, the applications and the pieces that you need to these institutions really haven't changed over time, like year to year, even decades, they, they remain pretty static. Yeah. I mean, I guess like if you look back at the the 90s or maybe the early 2000s, a, a big change was now it was online at least, right? You didn't have to mail things in, but but kind of since we got everything online, that's been been the last big innovation we've had in a while. So I'm wondering, you know, from yeah. that perspective, like maybe there's even the potential for AI tools to be able to make a lot of these processes more efficient. I know as a college counselor, like one of the biggest challenges I had was just I had you know, 30, 40, 50 students in my caseload applying to 10 different schools each. I mean, like, it's like I had to submit all these documents to all these yep. schools. And some of these, uh, you know, these platforms claim to be able to do that like very efficiently. And and, so, and most of the time it works, but then there's a lot of cases where it doesn't work. And uh, I wonder how AI might be able to just make some of those processes more efficiently. Totally. Like think about how in a very like do this tomorrow kind of way. There you are, college counselor. How many essays do you have to review? If you could pop a chat GPT, just do a grammar check. Can you do a warmth check? Can you do like different checks? Like, so as you're working with a student, these are kind of the impressions that this received. Is this the story you're trying to tell? Like, there are so many things that we could use help with. And in a process, you know, I was very, very lucky. I worked at schools where I was one college counselor for every 40, 50 students. I mean, we know that that's absolutely not true. That was still a lot of stuff to process even right there. Yeah. A lot of stuff. So those things, delivery of documents, checking authenticity of documents. Like there's so many things that again, being in the Techstars program, hearing how people and companies were utilizing these tools. It's like, oh, y'all, we're being very, very short-sighted and closed-minded about, about how this could be helpful. Let's maybe let's take it from a different stakeholder perspective here. So I I, I spend quite a bit of time just in the uh, Reddit applying to college group on on Reddit. And I, yeah. I enjoy kind of responding to some comments, especially from students who are like, help, this is my list. And what I've noticed lately is in this past class, there's a lot of students, you know, putting posts out there saying like, should I be using ChatGPT to write my essay or to like use it? How mm -hmm. should I be using it? Do you think colleges are going to be mad if I use it? And so I'm like wondering, you know, from your perspective, this is... Mm -hmm something that's obviously going to continue to come up in the way that students have used potentially used uh, chat GPT a lot to write essays in the last semester, you know, before we, we started this year here, to what extent do you think students should be using AI tools as they're working yeah. through their applications? So like I said, I'm not in schools anymore, but I always work with four or five students, just, you know, family, friends, things like that. And I, I need to keep my finger on the pulse. And one of my students said, you know, in kind of a conspiratorial way, how should I be using chat GPT? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And I said, well, let's do it this way. How would you use the internet to help you? And she was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you know, how do you use the internet to help with college admissions? Like, are you asking the internet to write your essay? Because you could. But what are you using it for? And research, getting students, like things like that. I'm like, well, let's just plug those questions into chat GPT to see what happens. And we're like, gosh, there's some really interesting things that have come up here. And so I, I not knowing a lot about how a student might utilize the tool, I didn't have an answer for her except to say, well, why don't we just try? What do you need to know about college admissions or what kind of help do you want? And let's just see what it does. And I think taking it from that perspective of acknowledging, I don't know, the story here. Like, let's learn this together. Let's take the bite out of it, right? Like, let's not go immediately to, it's bad, here's how, you know? And and I think what it showed that student was, oh, this thing's not going to solve any problems in her application for her, but it was just another tool that she had. So I think once that was just demystified, she kind of walked away and was like, you know, help find some yeah. information, but did not push her to think, this thing's going to write everything for me. This thing's going to frame me. Like, that's not how she, she used it at all. I think every time they update the whole thing, like it has so many new functionalities and so many different ways to play with it, that it's folly for me to think as an educator, I'm any more on top of technology than a teenager is. Yeah, definitely. There's just, and, I know more than we do. I mean, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of these students are probably already have more sophisticated ways or mm -hmm. uh, prompts to enter that to to figure it out that I'm even thinking about. But can I add one more thought to yeah. this though? Because I I just have to acknowledge this. I've I've been in admissions long enough, and technology changes fast enough now that I've seen several dramatic changes. Believe it or not, in '97 when I first got to WashU. 
access to fax machines. We believe fully in our hearts that by having access to fax machines, that that would cause our application numbers to skyrocket Mm. because then someone didn't have to take the physical action. We thought removing the, the need to print, to fold, to mail, to get a stamp, to put it, that that was such a barrier that having a fax machine would be the thing. And we had trainings on it and everything. Okay. Sometimes it happened. Sometimes it didn't. I then was the hero when the internet kind of became broadly available and in schools and everything. Oh my gosh. One of the biggest first questions, well, we can't trust students' essays anymore because you know they can just go to the internet and buy them now. Okay. Happen. They can just buy transcripts and send them. Well, that hasn't happened. All kinds of things like that have kind of come and gone or been with us. But there have been big moments recently. Online submission, like you pointed out, that has, I think, changed quite a bit in good and bad ways. We've been through these things before, though. And I think as a profession, as educators, we see that often our concerns get really overblown and that we all figure out, like, this is, again, just a tool without judgment, without value out, value judgments added to it, how do we learn to work with it? So yeah. on one hand, the AI conversation is a different conversation. On the other hand, it's not. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I think that's such a great point. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, I mean, I've also spent a little bit of time just exploring and, uh, you know, messing around with different prompts to like write essays myself. I even asked myself like, okay, 17 year old Daniel, I, I, ha- I still have my personal statement. Thankfully, like five years after I graduated from uh, college, I was like, let me hit up Boston University admissions and see, could I actually get it? Cause I didn't have it at the time. I was on mm-hmm. some old laptop that, and they thankfully had it and I got it. And I'm like very grateful that they were able to give it to me. So I like have my topic fresh on mine. So I kind of wrote it. I was like, um, I went into ChatGPT and said, I was like, hey, I'm applying to Boston University. Write me a personal statement. Uh, I wanted to include the themes of like overcoming failure. And I want it to be like include like a football analogy because that's essentially what mine was about. And I'm like, OK, if I write this, mm-hmm. what does it give me? It it wrote like a comp like a like a syntactically grammatically correct essay. But like it was it was a lot of fluff. Right. It was it, okay. it lacked substance. It lacked kind of like the heartbeat within it, which, it, you know, I think as admissions officers who read hundreds of these things, thousands of these things over a career, like it's going to, I think potentially it'll come off like pretty clearly that it yeah. wasn't, you know, it's not going to be one that totally like uh, blows you into like the accepted versus the, right. you know, the waitlisted or denied just because of that. Now, again, that was, that's assuming like s- some students are not much more like sophisticated and mm-hmm. uh, prompt engineering than I was. I mean, I spent probably 10 minutes doing different prompts. So I, yeah. I mean, I think as you, you get better with that, potentially you get a better response. But the other thing too, that I'm thinking about so when when I think about the nuance of of evaluation and admissions, right? What makes this also a complicated question is like not everybody evaluates the same way as we've we've kind of alluded to, right? You have like large universities, in mm-hmm. particular public universities, who they're going to ask you to submit writing samples, but most of the time, if like it's it's grammatically correct, mm-hmm. you kind of like have a beginning, middle, end mm-hmm. check, right? You did it. They're going to look heavily at your transcripts instead, right? And as long as you have the grades, usually that's like the biggest thing, mm-hmm. right? But then on the other hand, then you do have like smaller, more liberal arts institutions or things like that, that look at your essay, there's probably going to be more weight placed to that because it it does play like a bigger role. In addition, it's not to say these other things don't matter, Mm -hmm. but your essay actually could really matter here. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, like, I think the landscape is so diverse that even though these, these essays could be populated now, you're probably right that it's, it probably is going to help or hurt you no different than what it currently looks like, because a really, really good essay, could it really help you with this set of schools? And, you know, a mediocre essay doesn't really hurt you with these schools because they're looking very closely at your transcript. That's just like my assessment. I'm curious, like, do you, is that generally like your experience around like the landscape sure. or are you seeing something well, different? No, and I had two thoughts on this. So, so first I would absolutely agree with you that there are so many different forms of how admissions is done that we still call holistic admissions. So uh, Dr. Michael Pastato, who is at University of Michigan, does a lot of work studying that path to college, particularly for selective institutions, so places that are not completely open door. Uh, And his research showed that there are essentially eight distinct models of holistic admissions. Eight. Eight models. Oh, my God. That's even more than I thought. (laughs) Different ways of doing holistic admissions. And so I think, again, as an industry, we've dressed something up in this kind of mythology that makes students and counselors feel like they are more in control of this process than they are. But so I think that is one point that is absolutely just to put out there. And the second one, this is a, I don't know, both cynical and a little esoteric, but mm, 
I think we're putting a lot of concern and like you said, thought about essay. And I think students put a lot of effort and concern into that, but to what end? My gauge for whether something actually matters to a college and in their process is about verification. If a co- if something actually really matters to a college that impacts a decision, they get secondary verification that it's true. And by that, I mean, you submit your transcript, you don't send your transcript, right? Your school sends your transcript. They verify that. It comes through specific portals. Um, Your financial aid forms, your ability to pay, that's verified by someone else. When testing played a role, that came from outside agencies too. So I just put that out there that I think a part of this mythology of college admissions, there are clues that the process sends. There are signals that the process sends that says, this is really important. This is less important. If colleges were truly that concerned about the veracity of essays, they would have come up with a way to verify it with someone else because that's how the process has been set up. So I say that in a a way that is, again, cynical, but also to say to students, especially listening to this, your essay is important because it's the part you control the most. It's your opportunity to share your voice and to tell someone exactly what you want them to know about you. But to steal a quote from many deans of admissions, I don't even know who said it anymore. A good essay can cure a cold, but it can't raise the dead. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, in gazillion years of doing college admissions, I think the vast majority of 90% falls into that middle where it's, huh, I read it, right? Some might tip into the 5% of this is notable enough, it might make a difference. And some might tip the other way of 5% of that's notable enough, it might make a difference. That 90% is where most of these pieces of writing live. Yeah, so absolutely. Get yourself some slack, kids. Like, and, and I think colleges, again, like quit gnashing your teeth so much about this. If you actually cared about the veracity of a piece of writing sample from a student, you would have come up with a way to do it in a way that someone else verifies it because that's how you set up the system. And again, I mean, this might be a lot of people might hear this and think this is like a total load of baloney, but and maybe Mm -hmm. it's why I'm I'm in college access and I'm so like in love with this field. But I, you know, when I was through my college application process uh, way back when applying to schools, it for for just like it is for many students today, it was very turbulent and it was one of the most stressful times of my life up to that point. But it was also like a time of like tremendous growth and self reflection. And like I really like am proud of the personal statement that I wrote because I thought about it for months. I thought really, really hard about it. And I do feel like I grew a lot. And I feel like students who just are able to at least see that perspective. And I know right now, because I talk to a lot of students that there's so much pressure, right? It's like such a pressure chamber. And it's like, you're comparing yourself to your peers. You're thinking about what happened, you know, only worst case scenarios. But I'm also like, if I can get you to just like breathe for a second, look at your hands, realize you're still here. Everything's okay. This is also a chance to like really learn who you are, think about yourself in a way that you probably have not been able to do during your entire high school career and like really actually think about what matters to you. And it's like, you, you may not get it totally right, but like when in life do you, have you gotten this type of time up to this point? And I think like thinking about AI tools only from the context of like efficiency as a way to like produce an essay to mm-hmm. like make it quicker for you, what you're also losing is you're losing the opportunity to do that, to like self-reflect, yeah. you know what I mean? And like potentially have like a growth moment throughout that process. I'm so glad that that's how you work with students. I'm not surprised, but I'm so glad because I, how often, especially like parents would look at me like I was crazy where I'm like the college process done well, the real reward is not where you go to college. The real reward is an opportunity to be introspective, self-reflective, to define to explore your values, who you are, who mm-hmm. you're becoming. And like, isn't that a gift? And yeah. Look, you're like, you're like, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> but I think of the same thing. Like when I think about my running for the board for NACAC, the process that I had to go through of discerning my ideas, expressing my values, understanding my priorities in writing, in personal conversations, in a speech, was one of the best professional development experiences I ever had, just going through the process of that. And same with Techstars. Even if we hadn't received the funding or any of that, going through the process of having to define, to define our company and to get paperwork together and fight it, was like all of that stuff, that was huge. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. 
And so I, I absolutely agree with you a million percent. Like if if students had this space to to explore the personal growth and 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 thought that could go into this, I think they would have a really different experience with this process. But that's not that's not what we tell them is the valuable thing. Yeah. I, and it, yeah, I mean, we, it, I, I think across even just our field, but, it, you know, just across society in general, like trying to really do a better job of like emphasizing like the process and the product versus mm-hmm. the result. Like, I think we, it would be a much better off experience for students. I know my last year of Emerge, one thing that I was really proud of that we did uh, was we had like kind of like a celebration the day that a lot of students submitted their early mm-hmm. application. The day that like students were submitting their apps, like we were like, congratulations, like you, yeah. you spent months working on this and you submit, look what you did. Look at all Mm -hmm. the hard work you did. And like, regardless of outcome, like you did what you could do uh, to get to this point and like be proud of like the work that you invested. And I think the more we can do those kind of things and granted on the back end, there's opportunities to teach other life lessons. Like how do you do Mm -hmm. a failure? You know? Yeah. Sometimes you're going to get punched in the face and you got to, you know, be sad, take some time to be sad. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Then you got to come back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to come back, got to bounce back and you got to say what's next. You know what I mean? And so I, I just feel like, again, for a lot of students, Especially again for for a lot of young people who maybe haven't haven't like really got to experience life yet, like adult life. Yeah. Their whole life has been going waking up every day, going to six yeah. parties of class a day. This really is like life simulated in six months. You got highs uh-huh. and lows, ups and downs, failures, successes, and comparing yourself to others and like learning how to deal with all that. It, it kind of like is a is a like a intro to life one on one course in like six exactly. months time as you're you're applying there. And so that's why I think I've really enjoyed it. So I mean, yeah. maybe maybe one way. Um, I would then offer like how students could use AI is, is actually based on the the most recent episodes I just released with uh, Stephen Inno, which is what he's mm-hmm. doing is he's using AI to help students have like kind of almost like a thought partner with like determining their icky guy for projects. And it's like, yeah. I feel like that might be a really cool use case for yeah. students writing a paper. If like, you're not sure what to write about, maybe you could talk to AI, ask it to be like your virtual counselor and mm-hmm. say, hey, like, what do you, you know, based on these things I'm telling you about myself, what are you noticing? It seems like I really mm-hmm. care about what are my values? Because sometimes students like they have strong values, but they can't always name them. They haven't done done it yet. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, we um, don't give them a framework for it. We don't mm-hmm. give them tools for it. Um, this is something of a tangent based on the topic. But since we're since we're here, I'm going to share yeah. this. Uh, one of my very favorite books that has come out about the world of college admissions is by Ron Lieber, L-A-E-B-E-R, and it's The Price You Pay for College. And ostensibly, the book is about, have you read it? I haven't, but I'm adding it to my uh, list right now. To your list. <laughs> so in theory, the book is about how you pay for college, right? But as I've told Ron 50 million times, to me, it's it's the best framework for making a choice about where you want to attend that I've possibly ever seen. And if I were still in school, I would use that book as like my curricular guide because it asks those questions that you're talking about. It's essentially your buying a very expensive commodity mm-hmm. and you're buying it because you have expectations of what it will give to you in return. So understanding that, what do you value? What are you buying from them? And he frames, you know, the buying is like, you're giving them your resources, your resources of money, your resources of time, your resources of your presence, the resources of your intellect, right? Like you are paying that. So what are you buying? How do you define that? How do you find that in your search? And then how do you hold the institutions accountable for delivering that? And it gets to that question about value. What do you value? And it does yeah. it without judgment. Like if you value having a really great football culture, that's okay. That's okay. Just acknowledge it, add it to the list, see how the school is helping, you, you know? So yeah, that's absolutely. my tangent. But since you had mentioned we don't give students the time to think about what do you value. That book was the first thing that really pushed me to think about that question in the terms of college admissions. What do you value and what they're giving you and how do you hold them accountable for it? Yeah. I mean, and to your point, like the the more concrete and clear you are on the, the answer to that, that's like a playbook that helps you throughout the process from writing your personal statement to making your college decision to like reminding yourself why you're there when like things are really hard yes. and like you're away from home. Cause I know for me, yes. you know, when I went to college, I ended up going to, to be you. But one thing that I, I did not know about what I valued when I was there, which I like wish I would have, but again, it's kind of hard. Like I didn't really have anybody talking yeah. to me and like asking the right questions is I actually like really valued connecting with students that had like a similar background as myself. And I never, that never even crossed my mind that 
I would want like another person who understood mm-hmm. like the Mexican American from California middle income experience when I was at Boston University. And it wasn't until I was surrounded by like mostly rich, really wealthy white yeah. people all the time that I was like, oh, actually, like, it'd be nice to have at least one other person who really understood like, how awesome it is to have, you know, arroz con gandules or, you know, have some um, tapatio with my meal or stuff, just small stuff like that. And um, I really valued the experience of like being uh, with my peers there too, who are unlike me. But I think for me, what I often tell students is like, if you can find a college that both like challenges you and pushes you to be like very uncomfortable, but also has like spaces that you can go to where like you really remind yourself like mm-hmm. what it's like to be at home or what mm-hmm. it, to have that strong sense of belonging. That's really like the goal, right? It's like, totally. it's not a place that is only like home because then you may not grow as much as right. you could. You may not be exposed, but it's also not a place where like you feel so isolated that you feel like stigmatized or you feel like, you know, right. just like an outcast. You don't want that either. And it's, it's hard to find the both, but the more you think about it, the more hopefully you can find a place totally. that like strikes that balance. And I think that's a good way to like frame set up a framework that you hold then throughout, right? Because I think who I was when I started college, who I was when I graduated from college, radically different people. Mm. And it was only that life Mm -hmm. experience of being in college that caused me, now I would frame it as you did, right? What are my values here? Is this place fulfilling those values? Gosh, maybe I would like to be with more people who have my lived experience, but I also don't want to be too safe, right? So having that framework as you start it, saying this is why I'm here, as the reminder, but then to say, to go back to that, are my values still the same? Is this place still delivering? Are my values changed or become more clarified throughout this experience and to allow the student to hold themselves accountable, but also their institution? Yeah. So it's funny. We, I think we, we kind of gone in a circle a little bit where it's in a, in a world where like you've seen multiple technological innovations. I've seen, Mm -hmm. I, I think a couple as well. It still feels like at its core, like, you know, what we believe should be true throughout this process are like some of these like core experiences. I'm curious, though, like at this particular point, given like AI is definitely not going anywhere, what advice might you offer, you know, colleges and maybe as well, like what advice would you offer students about yeah. like how to just navigate this technological, you know, age we're in right now? Yeah, I think don't be afraid. and Don't don't enter the conversation in a place of fear or trepidation. I remember uh, when social media really exploded and became much, much, much more available. I was working at a high school at the time where the head of school who had zero social media accounts, had no children who had them, said, yeah, I don't think this is right that teachers are on this. So I'm going to announce at the opening faculty meetings that teachers can't be on Mm. social media at all. And if they are, they can't have any connections to anyone associated with the school. That came from a place of fear and ignorance. And then, and then, well, several of us on his team were like, no, 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 here's why it's such a bad idea. And we made a better decision. So don't approach this with fear. Be open minded to how this tool may or may not be helpful and, and be willing to be creative about things. Right. And I think that works just as much for students too. Like, don't, don't approach this with fear or perhaps too much emotional, like, don't, don't place too much on it, right? Like it's just a yeah. tool and be, be creative. Would you offer maybe the same advice for like students who are applying in, in yeah. this age? I think a lot of well, that does apply. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that I, I, I think that's just in general, just yeah. how to approach the world. You know, be afraid of things, be open-minded, creative, especially with technology. With everything that we've talked about today around like the admissions mm-hmm. and I know we like touched a little bit on like the college experience also in 2023, we talked about admissions, but so just like maybe as, as outside the box Mm -hmm. you want to go or within the realm of college access and admissions, you know, if you could wave your magic AI wand and like have a product or, you know, a a method using AI that actually like worked the way you wanted it to work, like what problem would you solve in education? Goodness. Okay. So I, I, I have this really intense, very, very big picture idea that I think that if we could accomplish this as a society, could solve so many problems in education, so many things just that that are plaguing us at this moment. So I can tell you the problem. I don't know how AI can solve it, but I feel like AI is something that could get us there. I feel like we could really do a lot of good in our world if we if we actually embrace the idea of lifelong learning. And by that I mean structurally that you that a, a, a parent would 
always be able to have access to education because childcare would never be a problem. That colleges or any institution could take risks because graduation is not necessarily the desired result that that acknowledgement that you should be coming in and out of the space of education your whole life. I don't know how to get there. But the more and more I think about that idea, the more I feel like a lot could really be helped in our yeah. world, you know? And so, okay, we've got this tool that has a ridiculous amount of power and interest. So how could AI, how could machine learning, how could that get us there? Yeah, it's, it's I, and that's not a very good answer. It is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm literally sitting here daydreaming about like this world that you're, you're charging me with. And I, I think my initial thought to like your statement was a lot of the most quote unquote, like financially successful people I know, people maybe I follow on YouTube or have read books on, they, I think they, a lot of them see life as what they would call, you know, that infinite game, right? This idea that like, as, as you've described, like you're always learning, right? Like your, your Mm -hmm. greatest asset is like your skills, right? And that your ability to develop your skills to uh, just continue to sharpen and enhance. Mm -hmm. But I don't think to your point that that is aligned with mainstream messages today Mm -hmm. about like society. A lot of it is like you get the college degree and like, congratulations, like you're ready for the workforce. And and in many ways, it's the same way that we treat adulthood, right? Where it's like somehow as if you cross this like main 18 year old line, like you're an adult now, check, like you just know how to handle everything. Like a 30 year old has like all their shit together and like knows everything about everything. And it's like, just not yeah. accurate right this is no. a process it's like uh, there's always learning growing yeah. failures right response yeah. and, and all of these things and i do think that as a society to your point if we're we're thinking about it this way it we probably treat a lot of different services experiences very differently than yeah than what we do now totally yeah. totally and you know what got mm-hmm. me on this idea like maybe four or five years ago maybe more than that there's a study about a small liberal arts college and i can't remember which one so i won't Try to make that one up. Small liberal arts college in a small town that has assisted living facilities for elderly people there. And many of them were former faculty or people who stayed in town. And they made classes open and available to any of the residents to take any of the regular classes. They still have the same requirements, but you can take any of the classes. And they made activities and everything available to any of the residents. And it grew into this very multi generational exchange. But that the older people who were participating lived longer, had far fewer brain challenges like dementia, things like that in a sudden health, you know, all of the things that we associate with negatives of aging very much improved because of that access. That's kind of one of the things that got me on this. Um, yeah. And thinking about how much we have viewed higher ed in that space that like you're pretty much done when you're 25. But we've set up colleges like that. Like how many colleges have dorms available for people to live in if you don't have a family, if you are able to share, right? Like if we cared about lifelong learning, we either would make affordable housing available everywhere regardless and not tie housing to that college thing, or that we would make that housing available at a college campus. That if you took student loans and you paused your education, but you wanted to return that you wouldn't start accruing or paying back right away. So that way you didn't feel like you had to stay in a job. Like you could continue if you needed to take time. Like, I think there's so many interesting things that could happen. Also yeah. just having a better educated country, society, world, society mm-hmm. that sets that you, know, you said, you know, you don't know all your shit at three. I turned 50 this year and I've never been more aware of how little I know. <laughs> right <laughs> and i went i was lucky enough to go through this amazing tech stars program where i got essentially an mba in entrepreneurship in four months i wouldn't have been able to do that in any other way in my life and frankly i would have feared that but that's yeah i get very excited when i think about that idea and what could happen yeah well and to your point it's like because of the fact that life paths tied to careers in so many ways are so are ascribed when we're so young, it really just like 
limits folks who maybe do want to like, it's, it's really hard. Like, let's say an example, I'm somebody who had 17 years old. I decided to go to the military or I decided to join the workforce, Mm -hmm. but then later in life, I'm like 24 years old. And I'm like, man, I actually would like to go to school now. And it's like the way that society is set up for a lot of those folks, it, it's it, it's like a really uphill battle to yes. climb, right? It's like, it feels yes. like you you feel like you're too old to go to school mm-hmm. and you're surrounded by like people who are younger than you. The, the way that the system, as you described, is designed is just not like built for you, whether it's the yeah. housing, whether it's the class times, any of those things. But it's like, in so many ways, like your perspective, ironically, actually would be the most valuable in that classroom because everybody else in the classroom has the same like youthful perspective. Right you're the one who actually has worked for many years and is going to think about things differently yeah. than the other, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds in the room. And it's like, if we had more diversity in classrooms and, and, yeah. and not just in terms of racial diversity, age diversity, regional, all of these things, like all it's just it. going to create a better conversation. It's actually yeah. going to expand everybody's thinking and everybody's yeah. going to walk out of there, like more understanding of like the world yeah. we live in versus just like, you know, being in the echo chamber of everybody's 18, 19 has the same like yeah. generational belief. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. So when as this, I brought this up in a conversation about diversity, so it's sort of doesn't have to do with diversity. And I'm like, well, you know, people of color get older too. Mm-hmm. Like we, we also live past 24. <laughs> like that, that also adds into that, right? This whole conversation about there being an enrollment or, or you know, demographic cliff. And oh my gosh, we're not going to have enough people to fill these college classrooms. Maybe if we said that you could keep continuing your education past 24, that wouldn't be a thing. Right. Like we've put these very, very strange constrictors that are, you know, so built on like the old industrial age model of workforce. But we've put these very, very strange constrictors around the idea of education and who should get it and when you should get it and how you should get it that I think have been really destructive for us. It's probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that. I mean, I'm, I'm for it, especially if AI can help us find a way to do this, I, you know, using technology to mm-hmm. help hopefully combine and just build bridges across different age generation, different regional generations. Maybe it encourages colleges to expand differently. And as you described, like not putting these artificial variables of like yeah. college is only meant for you if you're between 17 and 22 years old or graduate school, if you're slightly older than that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like your time and period in life to do it. And if you don't do it, like you missed it, right? You missed the train right. here. And <laughs> that's so sad. Yeah, it is. You know, Especially if, that well, and to your point, I mean, uh, sorry to cut you off there, but mm-hmm. I mean, uh, to your point, I mean, I feel like just many of us now we've lived, we, since life is like so long, which is like amazing. You, you could potentially like live multiple lives. Like why do you have to like stick to one career and like do that for 40 years and like be done? What if like for, 10 years of your life, you want to be in education. 10 years, you're like, actually, I want to be in, in sports management or I actually right. want to flip. Like, why can't you do that? Like, right. why not? Become, <laughs> I'm going to become a chef. Yeah. I'm going to learn glass blowing. I mean, any mm-hmm. number of things, right? Exactly and I mentioned right. those because those were things I really wanted to do at 18, you know? Yeah. And now uh, our, we culturally, societally, like we're not set up in that way. And I don't know. That's my big picture dream. Well, hopefully we can get there. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally, I, I'm, I'm with you. Let's everybody out there be lifelong learners, be curious, right? Don't stop learning, right? Learning doesn't happen when you get your cute little piece of paper, right? And uh, it's not just that there's so much more to it than that. I'm curious, like, Marie, I know you you do a lot of things. I'd love to just uh, hold space for you. You know, what what kind of resources, websites, uh, yeah. you know, folks are listening to this. They're like, I need some, some Marie in my life. I want to connect with ah, you. Like, how can cool. they connect with Thanks. you and in what ways? So, <laughs> well, first resource I want to share is not mine. I mentioned Ron Lieber's book. Love it. I think everyone should read it. I think it's superb. Rick Clark, who's the Dean of Admissions at Georgia Tech, has one of the best blogs about the path to college. And he has been writing really thoughtful, interesting pieces about the use of AI in college admissions. Probably the most forward thinking and creative thinking person out there about it. And he flat out says to students, if you want to use chat GPT to help with your essay, do it. Here are the ways that you can that wouldn't violate any kind of intellectual. So love that one. Uh, how you find me, check us out at acceptgroup.org. Uh, that's our website. You can always email me at leaders at acceptgroup.org. Like to learn more about the tech company, our website, although I have to admit, we're going to change our name soon for reasons that will be obvious. Our website is acceleratedequityinsights.com. <laughs> When I went to the Techstars program, again, I was the oldest person by 21 years, and all of the very, very sweet Gen Zers and young millennials in the group were like, 
oh yeah, we knew that company was started by someone older because there were so many syllables in the name. Like, thanks, kids. I never would have thought about that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're, we're trying to fix that. Uh, but those are the places where you can find me. Yeah, I'm, I'm out there on the interwebs, but definitely you can reach me at leaders at accept group dot org and um and any place where college admissions is being talked about. <laughs> awesome. You usually find me. Well, thanks so much for your for your time, Marie. I'll, I'm going to make sure too to include the links for all the the resources you mentioned in the show notes. So anyone, you can just click on the links in this episode as well if you're interested in connecting with Marie or learning more about uh, how AI is being used in college admissions from uh, Rick Clark. But uh, thanks again for your time today. This was great. Oh gosh, thank you so much, Daniel. This was such fun and truly like I talk about lifelong learning. You reached out to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to learn as much as I possibly can and digging. You know, I love having an assignment where I get to dig into something new. So thank you. Thank you for that opportunity to learn. Thanks for listening to the AI Education Conversation. Give a follow, rate, and review wherever you listen. For all show notes and to share your thoughts on today's episode, check out the AI Edcom on Twitter. See you next time.